Welcome to How to Be a DM. I'm Shelly Mazenoble, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. I said this to you uh, minutes ago and you laughed, but I did <laughs> refer to you as D&D royalty because you are one of uh, the probably more well-known, more prolific uh, game designers, Um I'm, I'll just read your bio because <laughs> your bio can say it better right. than I can. But I'm very excited to welcome James Introcaso here to How to Be a DM. Oh, thank um, you. I'm so excited. And it's been a long time coming. Um, but so you, a tabletop role-playing game designer who has worked on seven <laughs> official Dungeons & Dragons hardcover books. He's the co-creator of the Burn by RPG for Roll20, the author of the Any-Winning World Builder blog, and credited in more than 50 best-selling DMs Guild and drive through RPG products. <gasps> My God, I'm not done. Currently, James works full-time as the RPG line developer for MCDM, which is Matt Colville's production company. That is awesome. Uh, we love Matt. And this is the part that I really wanted to highlight. <laughs> Today, he's fulfilling a lifelong dream of being a guest on How to Be a DM. Did you think that this was something different than what it is? <laughs> like, no. What did you actually think we were inviting you to do? <laughs> no, no. So this is really great. And I was telling my uh, my wife, Bonnie, before I, I came here, like, this for me is very big um, because, Shelly, you are actual D&D royalty, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, I have a, a book with your name in it on my shelf and everything, Aww. and I have for a long time. And uh, I will say that for a long time, I was reading your column. Um, it was like Aww. what brought me to the D&D &D website and what made me uh, check out everything that you were doing. So um, Really? Yeah, yeah, it was very That's good. Crazy. Um, so I think I think that you are hilarious and a great writer uh, and a really great storyteller, um, which is why I am here to also join my voice in encouraging you to uh, to take the leap into the dungeon master's chair. I I mean we can just end it here because I feel like that is all I needed. <laughs> I am ready. I am ready. Um, I feel all of those uh, same things towards you. Um, because Thank I've you. been following you and your work for, for a long time. And as your bio um, explains, you have been credited in a whole lot of really, really wonderful <laughs> D&D products. So, so, I mean, you also, you have my email. Like, you know that if you ever really just want to be on how to be a DM or... <laughs> talk <laughs> just shoot me an email <laughs> that's awesome that's i mean it's great and it is it's a lot of fun to uh to get to work on on D, &D stuff because it's been part of my life for so long right um and so that's why it is great to like be able to to chat it up with you and it is shocking to me that you have never run a game uh because you're so uh you, your your life is <laughs> so much of this hobby, right? I like, know. you know, your your husband is Bart Carroll for crying out loud. So, yeah. uh, mm. you know, everything you do is D&D &D in that house. <laughs> it is. It's, it's all D&D 24-7. &D um, although I feel like our son is like leaning towards magic and it's kind of hurting me. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, uh, yeah, those cards are really cool and they do fun stuff. But have you seen this book? That's right. That's right. Well, maybe he wants to win, right? Like magic is the game mm. of people who want to win. And D&D &D is the game of people who never really wanted anything in life. So they're like, well, we're just going to yeah. tell this story together. Yes. So that's that's how I say it. <laughs> yep. That is that is probably very true. He does. He is rather competitive. So, um, but that is neither here nor there. Uh, we are here to talk about one shots, which is a topic that um, I have discussed before with the wonderful and inspiring Grant Ellis. Um, he gave me lots of great advice about it, but it's a topic that keeps coming up that people seem to keep wanting more information about. And it's a big topic and there's a lot to talk about. So it deserves another go round. I feel like one shots, I think, Grant and I talked kind of before the holidays and we were thinking the holidays are a great time for people to maybe run some one shots because you might be you know, having a little bit more time off and friends and family maybe aren't with you in person, but you want to have reasons you know, to get together online and maybe a one shot would be a great opportunity. But they, they go beyond seasons. One shots are perfect for, for lots of things. Um, 
but oh, yeah. you can can probably speak to that better than I can. What is the advantage of a one shot? Like, well, why do why are people so excited about one shots? So I think one shots are great because especially if you're like a busy person, right? Um, you might have a lot of friends who are also busy. Uh, so it's a great way to get together and say, we're all going to play some games together. We're going to play D&D together, but uh, we don't have the time to make a, uh, you know, weekly, monthly, bi-weekly game work. And so, but we do want to get together and play this. And so we can do it. I've done this with a lot of people that I've met in the community through, you know, Twitter or Facebook or Facebook forums or whatever. Um, and it's a great way to like, hey, this is, you know, we're, we're hanging out, we're getting to know each other. Um, and we don't have then the commitment of a longer schedule. Uh, it's also a great way for people to try out um, big ideas or wacky concepts, right? Like maybe you have an idea for something that is a level 20 adventure, right? And you can just skip and go right to level 20, which a lot of people don't ever get to play in D&D and you can do it that way. Or maybe you want to try to build an adventure concept around something that wouldn't be sustainable for like an entire campaign, but it would work as a, an adventure, right? Like maybe you, I don't know, let's say you love The Bachelorette just for instance. <laughs> I don't right? know. It's going to be hard for me to guess, but I'll try. I'll try. Um, you could create a, an adventure based on The Bachelorette that could be fun for fans of the show and you and your friends to like get together and play this Bachelorette adventure, right? And maybe that wouldn't be sustainable as a, uh, a campaign thing. Maybe it would. I'm not sure. I don't. Uh, I am not a Bachelorette fan, sadly. I think it would, actually. Um, so, you know, maybe it would, but if, but this is great testing ground for it as well, right? Like you, you and your friends can dip your toe in and see like, do we like this marriage of these two things? Oh, we do. And we're going to go for, you know, 24 seasons and go from there. Would you give this one shot a rose perhaps? Yes, and, exactly. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I like the idea of it as, as a testing ground yeah, yeah. I think it is a really great place uh, for that. And then it's also even more so a testing ground for new players, right? Mm -hmm. I do think um, I've gotten a lot of new players into the hobby by saying like, this is low commitment. It's it's all going to happen in one night. It's not a TV series. It's a movie, right? And that's yeah. the way we think of one shots, right? Is like, uh, this is one film rather than a weekly TV show that we're going on. And so if you play D and D and you decide you don't like it, then guess what? You're not locked in then for to this long thing. But if you do like it, eh, well, then we can keep playing again. And it's always the latter then, right? But people have yeah. that fear of like. I don't have time. How am I going to make this work? And one shots are the perfect way to do that. So I love the analogy of it's a it's a movie, not a TV series. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, so two questions from that. What do you think? And is there like an ideal time frame for a one shot? Is it like, I mean, like, oh, if you go past four hours, it's you're in a campaign now. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> what? What's the ideal timing? Yeah, so I do think, I think for D&D &D sessions, right, like a two to four hour session is good for most people with some breaks in there right. and everything. Um, and I think that holds true for one shots, right? Um, now, obviously, your mileage may vary with all the advice that we're going to talk about today, right? Um, it may be different, but I think for a lot of people, two to four hours is great. And it can be difficult to track your time and uh, and pack the entire story of the movie or the one shot yeah. into that uh, into that time frame, and so uh, time management is kind of a, a big thing when it comes to one shots, more so than when it comes to a campaign, because you can always, if you don't get done what you thought you were going to get done in a campaign, you can always pick it up next time you play, right? Um, and so that's probably one of the biggest things is like, okay, you've got two hours, you've got six players. That's, you know, if, if we start dividing up how much, how many minutes does everybody get to speak, right? Yeah. It's not a ton. Um, and so figuring out that balance, I think, is uh, is really important. So I think for a lot of new Dungeon Masters, time management is in the pacing is probably something that is feels a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if it's, like you said, a campaign, you have you have time to like build things out or, oh, they didn't get to this cool thing I was planning. We'll do it next week. But in a one shot, like you really do have to pack it all in. So how, 
are there like um like signposts like that you build into your adventure as a dungeon master like they have to get to this place within 45 minutes or something i don't know yeah how, how so do you pace it that's a great question right i like to uh if i'm writing the adventure right if if it's something that i'm preparing um i usually do it in just like an outline you know with broad strokes or whatever um uh or if it is a, a published adventure i will break them down into like scenes right like okay so this is the first okay. scene this is the second scene and then i will look at the time we have and say like this is how much time we have i think about for each scene right and maybe you know 20 minutes for st the start uh uh i think combats generally if it's a combat encounter you want to count on at least 30 minutes if it's um like an easy or medium encounter according to the dungeon master's guide sort of encounter building rules and if it's a hard or more complicated encounter that maybe has like a lot of terrain effects or traps or something like that 45 minutes i think to an hour uh for those encounters is usually pretty good to to count on um and so i'll, I'll sort of plot it out that way and i'll have my idea like okay as we're going i'm watching the clock but i also don't want to if we're all having fun with a scene right i don't want to think like well that's 20 minutes minutes and your time's up and so now we need to move on everybody's having a good time there's no point in like pushing us away from the scene so i also will have cuts ready um and i start those at the back of the adventure right so like i know often right you want it to end in a climactic clash or with a dramatic rose ceremony or something <laughs> else, right? Um, uh, some dramatic sort of climax that you're building to, right? And you're beginning, right? Those are sort of your essential point A to point B. But everything that happens in the middle, um, I think are places where you should be able to cut, right? And should be able to say like, okay, um, I, if we need to lose this scene, that's okay. Um, and I like to put those as far back and as close to point B as possible because you don't like at the beginning of the adventure, you don't know if you're going to run out of time or not. Right. So you can't yeah. cut stuff at the beginning as well as you can at the end. Um, and I will often think about those things like, uh, you know, for instance, if you have uh, a dungeon crawl and while they're spending all of this time at the beginning of the dungeon in your adventure, there's no reason the dragon has to wait at the back of the cave. If the dragon hears intruders are coming, uh, maybe, hey, look, the, the end boss has come to you. You didn't have to get to them because they're mad that you have been trashing all the kobolds in their dungeon. And here they are to, to battle you, right? Um, and so I think having those points and knowing, oh, I want to end up at point B, how can I bring point B forward if we're running short on time is important. It's like, okay, so every every time I have one of these conversations, somebody says something, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> like, but I think if new some new dungeon masters are probably like me and we feel like, you no, know, there's like a schedule and a, you have to stay very close to your notes. And right. we, when you have that, that mindset, then you forget that there's some very simple... Um, fixes like we're running out of time there's this big boss fight that needs to happen i'll just bring the monster out like that's just yes of course that makes so much sense that makes so much sense yeah yeah and it's a it is a hard thing to learn right and i think w like you know adventurers league writes their modules with um times in them because those are often one shots that are made to be played at a convention in a time slot that is yeah. very strict because you need to clear out for the next group that's going to come in and sit at that table um but they're also very good about saying, you know, these are suggestions. And if you have to skip a scene or you have to cut a scene short or uh, one scene goes longer than the others, that's fine, right? And I think it is important to let GMs know that like, yeah, even when you're running published stuff, you're not going to mess anything up. Um, if all that happens is your group spends the entire time in the tavern, right? And they have a blast in yeah. the tavern the whole time. Then you ran a great game of D&D. &D. Right. <laughs> like, then that's really the whole point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then the other thing is if you're cruising, you know, and, and you're clicking along and uh, like, hey, you're way ahead of schedule. Um, you can prepare, you know, some optional encounters to drop in if you want to. Or 
if your game wraps up 20 minutes early, but everybody had a blast, that's also great, right? Like everybody's time is valuable and it means you can spend more time than like doing the chill thing, catching up, talking to people about, you know, their new haircut or uh, their new job or uh, uh, the next game that they want to play, whatever it may be, right? So it's also okay to end a little early if everybody is having fun. Like it's it's the old stand-up comedy, leave them laughing, yeah. right? Leave them right. having a good time. Um, and so better to do it that way than to go too long. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so you don't have, again, there's not that much time here. Mm-hmm. So how, just judging from what, how you were saying, like you should leave 30 minutes for this type of encounter, except like, do you think, is there a sweet spot for like, you want to get two to three encounters in or one, like, like if I'm building this from, from scratch or, or a la carte, like how, Mm -hmm. how many do you think is good for players? So I, it really, this really does depend on your group and, and what you're doing, right? Some one shots uh, involve very little or no combat encounters. Right. Um, And I think that's fine. Right. Like if all you're doing is, is rolling skill checks and uh, having, uh, you know, uh, weird uh, foot race competitions or that kind of thing. Uh, I think that's good, but you probably know your group if that's what they like, right? I think for the average D&D group or for a group that you're not expecting, right, to to play, I would say for like a two-hour game, you want to make sure that you have at least one big combat, right? When we look at D&D... Um, a lot of the rules that and a lot of your class abilities are combat based and stuff, right? It's a game that runs combat very well and very cinematically. And so I think if that's what you're, if that's what your players are hankering for, you want to give them like that one really big one um, and possibly two, right? If you can get them two, great. Uh, in, in like a four hour, what I like to say is like, take the number of hours you're going to play, subtract one. And that's probably about how many combats oh. the average D D adventure might have right um you might have yeah. one let one fewer depending on the, the content um and so that's that's kind of a good uh just like a, a basic sort of rule to look at it's not a law uh you don't feel like you need to stick to that but i do think one is good and i also think that with one shots you can really turn up the difficulty then um uh, so, like, you could have a hard or a deadly encounter there because players aren't going to, like, pause and then come back next week to, without a rest, to continue, right? Like, you can really try to drain your players of resources that way. Do you feel like players, when they're in a one-shot, like, they they play more fast and loose with their characters? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it's the, I, I know I certainly do. Right. Um, and I think as a, as a GM, that's another reason you can turn up the difficulty is you've got that, uh, like, Hey, I, I only live once. <laughs> uh, right. I don't have to come back next week. And one of the best ways to be remembered in D and D is to have like a ridiculous over the top death or to do something that is over the top and succeed at it against all odds. And so I think during one shots, you're way more likely to put yourself in that position. Um, just like you're way more likely to have a gimmick character, right? We, you're more likely to run a gimmick adventure as a one shot because you can and the gimmick won't get old. Um, you're more likely to run a character who uh, has some sort of gimmick or is an obvious ripoff of like you know, Wonder Woman or Frodo Baggins or whatever. Um, Because, well, you're only going to play this character once. So it's great. We can all make the joke about, you know, Sir Fartface if we need to. (laughs) You'll need to. Right. (laughs) Um, Okay, so more about the players. Because one of, as, you know, a dungeon master, I want them to feel invested in this game, even if it is only going to be one time and only a couple of hours. And I think one of the best ways to do that is for them to be invested in their characters. So yeah. how do I get them invested in characters that they're only, that I know they're going to be playing fast and loose with, <laughs> and they're only probably going to play one one time with? How do you yeah. How do you do that? So there's two things that I like to do. Um, the first is like, if your one shot can have a, a goal, right? And I do think having a, a solid, Grant talked about this in his episode, having a solid, easy to understand goal for the players, like um, 
kill the bad guy, get the thing, save the person, break out of prison, whatever it is, right? A, a simple goal that they can understand is really good. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have twists and turns. You can totally have the the person you're supposed to save turns out to be the bad guy or that kind of thing. Um, but that goal, I think, helps if it is either mercenary in nature, um, or actually it should be both mercenary in nature and like a noble deed for D&D. &D. Because most characters mm -hmm. are either in it for the good deeds, they want to be heroes, or they're in it for the money. And so you've covered like 90% of character motivations if it can be like a, hey, we'll pay you to stop a bad thing from happening, right? That's, but you've, you've got a lot of motivations covered there. And then the second thing to do is... Um, Rather than have characters come with a prepared backstory, you set that up in the table in the first five minutes and you say like, okay, you know, this town is at risk or this dog needs to be saved and go around the table and tell me why, why is this town important to you? Who, who lives here? Who matters to you? Oh, okay. Um, you know, um, why is this dog important to you? Tell me about like a meaningful interaction you had with this dog one time, right? And now all of a sudden the players come up with it themselves, um, why their characters are invested uh, in this story. What is the personal stake? And that immediately raises the stakes them for them too, right? Like we've got to go save this dog because uh, he saved my little brother when he fell through the ice and started to drown. Okay, that's really cool. I like that a lot. Because I, I, one of the other things I wanted to ask you is, do you do anything with character backstories? Do you do anything with, like, how characters are linked together? But, I I mean, that that kind of solves that. If you're asking them like, about their tie, their connection to a town or to a dog or to a person in that town, you, you are kind of exploring a little yeah. bit of their backstory. Yeah, exactly, right? And that lets them develop the character kind of organically throughout the mm -hmm. adventure because they've decided they have this connection. Uh, and now they're all connected to each other because they have the connection to the town or that sort of thing. Um, you can also ask them right at the beginning, how do, how do you know each other? The person to your right has saved your life some way. Um, tell me how, right? And that can also then create this bond that they all have very suddenly. It, that's a great idea. And I like... Th that for new players, especially because if you say like, tell me how you know each other, like that could, it seems like a simple thing, but it's kind of overwhelming to a new player. Like I, now I'm on the spot and I have to <laughs> role play and I have to figure out, can, I don't know how we know each other, but like, I like that you're like, this person has saved you in, in your life at one point. Like, what was it? Giving them that little prompt. Yeah, yeah, really exactly. Cool. exactly. Exactly. And it, you know, then immediately, oh wow, I owe this person my life, <laughs> right? Like I yeah. they we and we've all saved each other in some way and so now we're we're off to the races. We trust each other and we're good to go. Yeah. And I also think I do think starting uh, if you do have new players, um, or even for a new GM, right? If you're a new GM, uh, even if your players are old hat, um, starting at level 1 is good because the game is less complicated at level one, right? Characters are mm -hmm. less complicated. Monsters that uh, they generally face at those levels are less complicated. Um, and so challenges can be very simple, right? Crossing a, a chasm is a lot harder at level one than it is at level five when people can fly and stuff. Um, so I think that's the that's like a, a good thing to do. And then another good thing to do in your one shots, if you have new players, is to start with the basic concepts and build from there, right? So start with ability checks and skill uh, checks and uh, casting spells before you get into combat so that they understand... Oh roll a d20 and add a modifier is how this game is built. And now, now I understand in combat, roll a d20, add a modifier. Now I get to roll another one of these dice and that's cool, right? Wait, so. say that again? Okay, so you want, I like that. That I mean, I, I, I get why it's important, but how, are, how would I work that in before combat if I want to get them used to that? Right. So, um, so like one of the things that you could do is, uh, if you were in a, a prison break like scenario, right, you all start in jail and you've all got to escape or you're in a, uh, caved in dungeon. Um, and now you've got to move the rocks, right? So first thing we're going to do is move these rocks. You tell me how you're going to move the rocks. Oh, you're going to lift them. Okay. That's an athletics check. And here's how okay. a strength athletics check yep. works, right? And we learn about the D20. We learn about adding a modifier. We learn 
learn about uh, adding your proficiency bonus to the, your strength modifier if you're proficient in it, right? All that kind of stuff. Um, and so then, oh, we've moved the rocks and whoa, uh-oh, looks like there's, you know, uh, a, a bugbear there and they're going to kill you. Um, so now we're into combat and that's how that works. Would you let a player use, like, could they magic missile the rocks? Like, would you let them use spells just to do things oh, outside yeah. of combat? Yeah, absolutely. I would, um, you know, basically uh, anything that the player wants to try that I think sounds cool, um, I I basically let happen, right? Because either it's going to happen and it will be a great story or it's going to fail spectacularly and that's yeah. also a, a great story. So, um, you know, I am definitely of the uh, Matt Mercer, you can certainly try school of thought when a player comes up with a, a original idea. Yeah. You got to reward those original ideas, sometimes with a failure, but it's yeah. still a reward. Yeah, so, right. And that player, they're using a magic missile that they could use somewhere else. Um, so it's good to make it just as useful uh, in the blowing up the rock situation as it would be yeah. in blowing up a bugbear. So would you recommend for a new dungeon master to, if they wanted to do a one shot, to try to build something a la carte or to do a published adventure? What do you think is the best course? So I do think it's about kind of what excites the dungeon master most. So if they have an idea that's really exciting or they have a concept that they feel comfortable with, right? Like that's one reason why I bring up um, The Bachelorette with you is because you would probably feel very comfortable improv yes an episode of The Bachelorette, right? Um, and so I think if you have something you feel really comfortable with, that's a great thing to do because then if the players surprise you and do something you're not expecting, you're still ready for it because you still know how this kind of story works. Um, that said, that's why published adventures are great, right? So if you don't have a great idea, uh, having the support of a published adventure is good. And they're easier to prep because you just basically read them and go. Um, and there are a lot of really good adventure collections out there on the DMs Guild um, that uh, and on drive through that people can check out. I know you have you had Ashley Warren on um, uh, before. She's the author of the Uncaged Anthology series, which is many, many adventures, um, uh, you know, and that's one great one that has a ton of awesome adventures across all levels. So you could find level one for new players or uh, higher than that if you wanted something higher than that. Uh, and I have like a whole list of stuff, right, that uh, that you can pull from. Um, the, the Book of Seasons, The Princess Project, if you're into princess things, Unbridled is a collection of of hag and unicorn themed adventures that nice. uh, was inspired by a Jeremy Crawford tweet. <laughs> um, and unicorns. Yeah. Exit Pursued by an Albear is uh, is great if you like uh, Shakespeare. Um, so they're all Shakespeare inspired uh, oh, adventures God. based on Shakespeare plays. Uh, uh, M.T. Black and J.B.C. Parry are two uh, prolific adventure writers who put out Definitely. collections that are cheap. Um, and then uh, I led the design of a uh, of something called Tactical Maps Adventure Atlas. So a, a while ago, Wizards of the Coast put out um, tactical maps that you can, you know, like unfold or you can uh, buy them in Roll20 and they, they you know, uh, load up on the virtual tabletop of your choice, actually. I think there are a couple places that have them. Uh, and then we wrote four short adventures that go along with each of these 22 maps, right? Wow. Um, and so, like, the prep is all done for you. You don't even need to draw out your maps. Those are good to go, right? And it, it continues. Unbreakable Anthology is uh, all uh, Asian-American authors um, who put out a, a book of uh, Asian-themed uh, adventures. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, uh, they're not all Asian-American. Some of them are from Canada. Some of them are from other places in the world as well. That's really great. Uh, I know you had Mike Shea on. He writes mm -hmm. a bunch of uh, adventure collections, fantastic adventures and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of resources out there that that people can check out for one shots as well. That's amazing. <laughs> there's yeah. so much. Yeah, I love how there's basically like, and I actually think that there are some bachelor themed adventures out there. Um, Chris Lindsay sent me one that like, yeah, this yeah. might be what tips me over. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and it would be the the best of of both worlds, right? And there's a lot of people who put up things. Um, 
for free too that you can explore and you should feel free to tear those adventures apart and make them work for you right. um one of my favorites is called a wild sheep chase um and it's by winghorn press i think they put it on the dms guild for free uh and it is uh, the adventure starts with the talking sheep uh and it gets Sold. weird and fun from there so yeah it's good There's something stuff. for everyone yeah yeah, okay. definitely. I mean, we covered a lot of ground here. We did. And we did. So are you ready? Is this, is, are we getting the commitment here from you, Shelly? I feel like I'm readier. <laughs> I do feel like one shots are definitely um, where I need to focus because obviously, like, if it goes spectacularly wrong, mm-hmm. don't have to worry about it. Um, I like the freedom that the one shots offer i don't have to i mean like i want to be a good dm and i want characters to be invested and i want their backstories woven in in super cool ways and all that and i can't start there i can't (laughs) i think i need to just start with a you're all strangers to me and (laughs) who knows where you're gonna go so it definitely i feel like you you have given some good uh reasons for one shots to be where i start Definitely. And I think, like you said, you know, it's a, it's a low risk to you, um, mm-hmm. just as it would be to, uh, to players and stuff. And I think the other thing to remember is that like your players want to have a good time. They're not actively going to work against you. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think they're going to want you to succeed as a GM, just as much as you're going to want them to succeed and have a good That's time. Really sweet. <laughs> I just want them to have fun. Yeah. I mean, it depends on who, who on the Watsi staff you play with, obviously. Um, so there is some yeah. real jerks there who might, uh, who totally. might try to trip you up. <laughs> I, I can definitely think of some people that are not going to be participating in my first game. That's oh. true. They're all so mm-hmm. nice. They really are. <laughs> yeah, you have a great crew. A great crew. Um, speaking of great crews, you're great. And, oh, thank you. Uh, so are you. I know that you are, are just a... Uh, you are a great resource for for players and for dungeon masters, and there's probably other topics that maybe you and I could could talk about on a future segment. So don't be a stranger. If anything, Won't. like you know, uh, inspires you that you want to share or want to talk about, please feel free to shoot me an email. Let me know. Oh, awesome! Thank you so much. Yeah, it's always great talking with you. New sometimes new dungeon masters don't know we don't know what we don't know. So. That's true. We lean That's on, true. on new experts for that. Well, and sometimes game designers learn great things from new dungeon masters because we've been so close to the game yeah. for for so long. You know, we're we're in it all the time. And so it's great to chat with people to see what their concerns and questions are so we can make better things to support you. That sounds great all around. So if people do want to find out what you're working on or uh, send you a, a note of gratitude for all the things that you have worked on yeah. um, where where's the best place for people to find you? So uh, Twitter is the best place to find me. Uh, it's just my name, James uh, Intracasso, I-N-T-R-O-C-A-S-O. Uh, so uh, and that's where I am. Um, you can check out uh, Fantastic Lairs, which is a book of 23 one-shot adventures I just released with there we go. Uh, the aforementioned Mike Shea, Sly Flourish, and uh, Scott Gray, who is... Uh, been working on D and D for years and years, and amazing. So dream um, team, right there. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and also, um, uh, if you're interested in one shot adventures and GM advice, I do work for MCDM, and we just put out Arcadia, um, which is a, a magazine uh, that we deliver through Patreon and through our store and stuff. And it has one shot adventures in it, so you can check out stuff there too. So, all right, if one shots are your jam, Dungeon Masters, you've got a lot of resources here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And hit me up anytime. I love to talk uh, one shots in D&D. So this is great. Aww, Thank you so much for best. having me. Thank you for being here. 